tides. They exist due to the relationship of gravity between the sun, the moon, and the earth. The immense gravity from the sun pulls the earth's oceans towards itself. The same can be said for Cousin Moon. As the world spins and the sun and moon around it, the tides push and pull, creating what we know as high tides, low tides, and most importantly, the intertidal zone. Hey world, I'm Gordy, and today on Frick I Love Nature, we're gonna learn how life survives in an ecosystem exposed to air half the time and the other half submerged underwater. This may look like a tiny beach volcano, but in fact it's home to something much less cool than a volcano, the ghost shrimp. These little guys thrive in the intertidal zone by digging themselves deep beneath the sand. Most of their body is just one huge super ripped ab. This helps them burrow up to four feet beneath the beach, feeding off of chunks found in the seafloor sediment. If they feel like it, ghost shrimp can hold their breath in their little beach burrows without oxygen for up to six days. They're called ghost shrimp because they're totally see-through. If humans were see-through, they'd look like this. That said, not all things that burrow into the ground are cute and spooky. Some look intimidatingly girthy. I wanted to learn more about these fellas, so I met up with Eric, a gooey duck farmer. Where does the gooey duck call its home? They burrow down into the soft substrate in both the subtidal and the low area of the intertidal zone. Just right out here, for example, between Tree Island and the Comox Bluff, the original gooey duck bed probably held 25 million gooey ducks. They burrow down into the sand as a way to protect themselves from predation. Now, normally, they only go down about two feet, but if the, this, the sand starts to shift over time, and because these animals can live to be 150 years old, the sand might build up two or three feet higher than where the clam is, is located itself, and it can't move. So the only way it can survive is to have his siphon grow longer. And the deepest ones I've seen were over five feet long. So if, they, if you had the tip of the siphon up by your, your face, the, the body of the shell would be on the ground. That's pretty long. Is, is a gooey duck super strong since they're just like just tough muscle? It's strong. If, if, you, uh, take, if you took hold of a, the, the siphon of a, of a fully grown adult gooey duck and you tried to pull against him, uh, he would pull you right down in the ground. So this thing starts from a tiny little speck and then can be like a super macho beast. <laughs> he can. He would uh, basically put you to shame. <laughs> During its much longer than average life, the gooey duck will do whatever it can to maximize its chance for survival. The horseshoe crab has been maximizing its chances for survival for the past 450 million years. It's got blue blood, and it depends on the intertidal zone for hosting its annual crab orgy. Once a year, when there's a full moon in the sky and spring is in the air, a male crab will latch onto a female, and they will shimmy onto shore to lay up to 80,000 eggs along the beach. This allows the soon-to-be-hatched young to dig into the sand and hide from predators during low tide and come up to feed during high tide. This strategy works well for the horseshoe crab, but even better for the surrounding wildlife. Out of the 80,000 eggs that are laid, around 79,990 become food, and 10 make it to adulthood. The horseshoe crab may get to have beach coitus, but you can find this shellfish on pretty much anything. Meet the barnacle. When they are born, barnacles float around the ocean till they find something to attach to, cement themselves to it, and then stay there for the rest of their lives. They can do this because they produce the strongest natural adhesive in the world, which can stick to just about any surface under any condition. Their natural cement is still more effective than any glue synthesized by humans, even superglue. They are able to spend their lives in intertidal areas because in addition to being immensely sticky, they can breathe in both air and water. They do this using sea lime, which not only act as feeders, but are able to extract oxygen from this and these. 
And just so you know, they have the longest penis in relation to body size in the world. Despite this intimidating quality and their strong outer shell, some creatures still choose to make them part of their diet. Like a lot of animals that live in the intertidal zone, the ochre sea star seeks out tide pools to keep moist during low tide. To eat barnacles, sea stars use the powerful suction cups on their arms to pry open the barnacle's face. Once their meat is exposed, the sea star pushes its stomach out of its body, envelops the prey, and slowly dissolves it until there is nothing left. If they get an arm trapped off during feeding, no sweat. Sea stars are able to regenerate lost limbs and sometimes even completely regenerate from just a single limb. This is because unlike humans, their bodies continue to grow throughout their lives. So if something gets chopped off, their cells will keep expanding and grow to whatever size maximizes their chances of survival. By molting, crabs can regenerate their limbs as well. To learn about how these spiders of the sea survive in the intertidal zone, I met up with a crab researcher, Yevgeny. Why would they choose to live in such a harsh condition? It's always dry or wet. Why would they live here? Well, there's a lot of different animals that live in the intertidal, so they have a ton of different food. Another advantage is that when you're out on land, you can pretty much hide away, and then there's very little risk of getting eaten by a predator. If some sort of very crafty seagull turns over your rock and finds the crab, then uh, you're, in, you're in bad luck, but otherwise it's a pretty safe place to be. If you were a crab, what type of crab would you want to be? Hermit crabs are really interesting because uh, in addition to their own shell that they grow, they actually find, uh, for example, seashells, um, and then they contort their body to the shape of the seashell. So when, when they get too big for one shell, they start looking for a new home. And there is a, a bunch of uh, plastic and ocean pollution nowadays and so once in a while you walk around along a beach and you see a, a bottle cap or something moving along and you turn around and it's just a crab that found a new home inside of one of our pieces of garbage. Ah, it all works out. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't say that. So how does life survive in the intertidal zone? Some animals have adapted to be able to breathe in both air and water. Others have learned to hide their girthy bodies deep beneath the sand. And that life here is about keeping out of the sun and staying wet. The intertidal zone, a moist, diverse, alien world. Time to go meet my people.